Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, where we're going to be talking about how to make your most difficult customers your greatest advocates. Um, let's go ahead and jump onto the next slide and we'll get into the content because we've got about an hour here and I want to make sure we use every minute of it um, to go through the content and give you a chance to ask questions. Um, so let me just start by saying this is part of a regular series for those of you have, who haven't joined us before. We do this every month on the second Wednesday of every month at 1 p.m. So you can set your, set your calendar reminders. Um, we try to stay on course with a certain topic for a period of time. Um, this uh, series is going to go up uh, one more month and then in June we switch to a, a different topic. Um, so we've got lots of um, lots of more to come this year. Um, once again, all these topics are driven off of ideas that come from you, um, things that you've asked us to talk about. So you guys are in the driver's seat and as far as telling us what kind of uh, development of sessions you want to hear from us. Um, Today's session is going to run about an hour. Uh, we hope to get done with the content before that, leaving plenty of time for questions. But we're going to be doing a lot of uh, engagement throughout this session. So this is definitely not just a uh, sit back and just listen to us talk. We want you to engage with us. Um, that being said, because we do have a number of people here, we have automatically muted everyone here. Um, if you do want to be unmuted, uh, just raise your hand or let uh, uh, let myself or, or Michael uh, Utzman know. Uh, We've got three people on from the UNC Charlotte side here uh, with you today. We've got myself. I'm Jeff Anderson. I'm a program director here at UNC Charlotte's School of Professional Studies. Uh, we've got Michael Lutzman, uh, who is going to be here, here from our in a playing a producer role. So if you have technical questions throughout this, you can't find where a button is or something in Zoom. I think we're all pretty fluent in Zoom these days, but uh, he is here to help make sure things run smoothly. And then we've got Rob Dibble, and I'll say a, a bit more about Rob in just a moment. Um, but as this slide is indicating, as far as rules of engagement, I talked about the time, I talked about muting. We've also got um, a lot of, as I said, engagement. So we want you to use your chat feature in this. Um, we're gonna be doing a lot of, you know, Rob's gonna be queuing up a lot of questions. We wanna hear from you and you could either use your chat or as I said, you can raise your hands um, and we can, we can unmute you. We can, have, we can actually hear your voices. Um, after the webinar, I'll just say a couple quick things. We do, as I mentioned, want your feedback on, on what you thought of this topic and what else you want to hear from us. Um, and we'll be giving you some more tips, too. We always follow up these webinars with a recording, uh, so you'll have that. Um, if you're here today, uh, we'll be sending you a recording of today's session, as well as uh, some, some resources that you can use to kind of dive, dive deeper into this topic. Um, this is just one of many topics. We've got over 30 certificates. Um, and a lot more course topics that we cover here at the School of Professional Studies. Plus, we have a custom area, Employer Solutions, uh, that is run by Amy Wortham. Um, you can check, there's a link to, to this later in the presentation to her section of our, of our content and our resources. But basically, anything you hear today, we can go deeper in. We can do customized or, um, programs for individuals and organizations. Um, well, not customized for individuals, but customized for your organization, your group team. And we have individual courses that can to, uh, allow you to go deeper into this. So lots of options to go deeper into this or any of the other topics you hear us talk about in these sessions. Um, go ahead into the, the next slide. Um, and we'll just talk briefly about what we're going to try to cover today. Um, specifically, you know, making difficult customers your, your greatest advocates. Um, it's, it's, it's tricky. It's easier said than done. Um, so we've got a few things to cover today. Understanding the importance of every customer. That's key. Uh, as well as recognizing how to respond when you do have an angry customer on the line or somebody who's had a bad experience somewhere along their journey. That's, that's a great opportunity. It might sound in, counterintuitive to say, but that's actually a great opportunity to turn somebody into your greatest advocate and be a big competitive advantage for you. Um, and then we've got some tips and techniques on how you might go about that. Um, some things can be done pr um, proactively to prevent some of these issues but not everything. And so we have some specific tactics you can do when you've, when something's made it through the cracks and hopefully it's, it's few and far between, but we know that it's going to happen. So how do you identify those? So you make the most of those opportunities and I'll call them opportunities um, that we have to really show showcase how much we care for the people that we're serving. Um, so um, that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Rob Dibble. Rob has got, uh, well, this is going to, this is going to be a fun experience for me too, because I love watching Rob, facilitate sessions. Uh, Rob's been doing a learning development for organizations and corporations for more than 20 years. Uh, he's got his own um, organ his own consulting business. So he's got ACE 
uh, learning and consulting. I was had the second word was uh, eluding me. Ace learning and consulting, but he's also been an instructor for UNC Charlotte for many years. He's an alumni of UNC Charlotte, so uh, this man is he, he is he is a 49er true through and true. So um, that being said, Rob, I'll turn it over to you and let you run it from here. Awesome, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, and hey, Chris, I, I see some 704 shop. Uh, folks in the chat box. What is up, Chris? Uh, happy to be here. Uh, and Chris called me a super alumni. Just, just so you guys know, I actually have an ambulance I use for tailgating UNC Charlotte football games. So if you come out to a football game, you see a big green ambulance, that is me. Uh, but I'm happy to be here with you guys today. Happy to uh, talk, uh, talk to you guys a little bit about this topic around customers uh, and, and how do we how do we take these customers that maybe sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes they get on our nerves and we're like, seriously, you're asking me this question? But I love what Jeff said, that we can take that customer in as weird as it sounds, that's actually a great opportunity for us, right? So, um, so I'm happy to talk about this topic, happy to be here with you guys. As Jeff said, we're going to try to keep this interactive. We want things to be flowing back and forth between you know, what I'm saying, what you're thinking, we're going to use the chat box primarily for that, just because it's easier than trying to manage people talking, right? Uh, and one of the weird things in virtual training is that I want you guys talking while I'm talking. I want y'all having some, some conversation. So feel free to just put whatever you think into the chat box, uh, you know, and I'll be checking in on that. I'll be watching that. So if you say something there that I, th that I think is really relevant uh, to what we're saying or needs to be shared on a, on a, on a bigger stage, and I'll pull that out and might even ask you to come off mute so we can uh, so we can expand on something that you said, right? Um, I also want to point out that uh, apparently this is uh, this is bald guy day with UNC Charlotte because we got Jeff and me and Michael and we all have the same haircut. Uh, so I hope you guys like bald guys because that's who you got today. Um, all right, so let's get into uh, let's get into our content. Jeff already went over uh, already went over our our objective, so we know where we're headed. But let's just start off. I love starting off with just kind of something really basic, right? So how do you define difficult? Like, how do you define that? What comes to your mind when you think, when you think difficult or maybe difficult customer or something along those lines? And you might even think about yourself, right? I read this and my first thought was, man, there's been times where I've been the difficult customer. I spent some time in customer service. So I try not to be that person, but let's be honest. All of us have kind of fallen into that difficult customer role. So what do you guys think when we say, how do you define difficult? Let's see, um, throw that into the chat box. Let's, let's see what you guys uh, come up with. Let's see, um, Shonda says complaining. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. When I managed the customer service team at, uh, I'm gonna date myself at First Union back in the day, you know, my guys would complain about customers complaining. And I was like, well, generally customers just don't call us up to see how our days are going, right? They usually call us because something went wrong. Um, let's see, uh, just, ooh, uh, Joyce, just generally rude, um, not easy to get along with, unreasonable expectations. Kim, that's, that's an interesting one. Means somebody maybe miscommunicated at something, at some point, if they have unreasonable expectations, lot, not listening to reason, demanding, um, someone who does the opposite of what is expected of them, okay, yeah, relentless on getting their way, ooh, likes conflict, kind of almost thrives off of it trouble expressing their needs. That's a really good one. When their idea of a reasonable solution is unreasonable, <laughs> I understand. So Chris, can I get a whole bunch of free 704 shop stuff? Is that an unreasonable request? That probably, right? Um, yeah, let's see, Monica, uh, ones that are very upset, disrespectful, not listening, re-delivering. Yeah, expect you to be able to read their mind. Yeah, all of those are really good ones, right? Um, clearly, we have a lot of different answers to this question. I mean, we kind of look here and we, we can see some of these different challenges we have, and you guys have, have mentioned some of these, right? Not responding, forceful, insensitive, demanding, yelling. Uh, sometimes I love, we've got too optimistic, so that's one way, or they're too negative. <laughs> that's the other way, right? Either they're unapproachable or they're avoiding conflict or they're driving headlong into conflict, right? All of those things create these, these difficult customers for us. So, so let me ask you guys, why does this matter? Why, I mean, why are we talking about difficult customers? Why is this something that matters? What do you guys think? You throw that into the chat box. Why is this something that matters? And for those of us that have worked in customer service at some point, or maybe you currently work in customer service, we know why this matters, right? Um, inevitable, uh, it's inevitable that we will encounter them yet. 
Yeah, Chris, that's, that's a great spin to put on it, right? It's for the business opportunity. I love that way of thinking, right? When somebody's, when somebody's a little upset about something, well, that's an opportunity for us to, to, you know, you know, say, Hey, let, let's, let's, let's fix this and, and build a loyal customer out of this, right? And Chris, as Chris says, customer acquisition is expensive um, and time consuming and difficult, right? Uh, ensuring world-class customer service to many customers as possible. Yes, Caleb. Um, yeah, it puts the edge in fi a flight or fight. Absolutely. You know, I'm actually, I'm going to, I'm going to give Chris a little bit of love here because I've got an example of, of this, right? I bought my very first 704 shop shirt. Um, and it's been years ago, but 704 shop shirts are cut a little bit differently than a, than a normal, normal t-shirt, right? So I don't know if you guys have, have bought anything from 704 shop guys, but they're awesome. They're a local, uh, local company. Um, and I got my, I got my t-shirt in the mail and I put it on and it didn't fit the way that I expected it to. Right. And so, so I called them up and I was like, Hey, you know, this, this t-shirt doesn't fit the way I thought it would. And they, the, who, whoever it was that I talked to did a really good job of saying, Hey, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that it didn't meet your expectations. Our shirts are cut a little bit differently. I kind of described my frame and he said, okay, well, this is the size you probably want. Took care of everything. Just like, just like that, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't unwilling to compromise. I wasn't being hard, uh, you know, to deal with or anything like that. Um, but the response from from the person there at 704 shop was so easy and I felt like he cared and he was he was almost personally hurt that the t-shirt didn't fit the way um, that it should and from that moment it actually built a loyal 704 shop customer out of me because I had such a great experience in dealing with them right so when we find that we've got these difficult customers when we situations just don't go the way we want them to we can take that and we can make it uh, even something better, right? Um, I love what Joyce says here. You want to keep your customer client, uh, but having to deal with someone who's difficult makes your day week harder than it needs to be. Yeah, so we got to balance that, right? We, we know that, oh man, you're going to make my day hard. You're going to make things a little bit of a challenge for me. But but through this, you know, we might be able to, to, to win not just a customer, but, you know, multiple customers out of this. Because what we're going to see is people talk. Right. So I love this quote here that we have uh, from from Sam Walton. Right. There's only one boss, the customer. Right. And he can fire everybody in the uh, in the company on down simply by spending his money somewhere else. Right. And nowadays, more than ever, it is easier just to go find someone else. Right. You, we don't have to keep going to the same place. We can go somewhere else. Right. Um, and really, the, the reality is the only reason most of us continue to be employed in jobs is because of handling customers, right? And if we handle customers, we're gonna we're gonna roll through some of those some of those disgruntled ones, right? And oftentimes, a difficult customer that has experienced a service breakdown of some sort, something went wrong. Maybe it was on their end, maybe it was on our end. Something went wrong, right? We can actually turn those folks into the most powerful advocates for our organization, the most loyal customers we have, right? But it's all in how we handle them, right? It's all in how we handle that disgruntled or upset customer, right? So let me ask you guys this question. Throw into the chat box. Um, rank customer service in this country from one to 10. What, what do you guys think? Where would you rank customer service in this country from one to 10, with 10 being the best amazing customer service and one being it was terrible, it was awful. Where would you guys rate customer service? Let's see. All right, we got we got a whole bunch of threes, whole bunch of threes. We got some fives in there. We got one seven. Yeah, Caleb, it does. It depends on the place. So this is going on average. Uh, Jeff says four. Ashley says depends on location. Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay. Ooh, interesting. We have post pandemic, uh, five. Pre pandemic, seven. All right. So yeah, I mean labor shortages and some of those kind of things have absolutely impacted customer service, right? Yeah, so, I, you know, I think personally, um, I'd probably put it somewhere between a four and a five, but there's those places that, that are knocking out nines and tens, right? On a pretty consistent basis, right? And as uh, Nick Rue here says, depends on company and individual providing the service. It really does, right? And some companies, they, I mean, they put their stake in the ground and say, this is what we're about, right? Um, I mean, you can compare like say McDonald's service model to Chick-fil-A service model, right? I mean, those two companies are, are night and day as a company. Now you might find a, a certain McDonald's location 
or a certain individual at McDonald's that delivers Chick-fil-A level service, but as an organization, they prioritize things just a little bit differently, right? Um, and I think it's easy for us to look at the places that we go to on a regular basis and we go back there because of the service, right? We, we, we recognize, hey, if something happens and I, and, I, and I don't have a good experience here, they make it right, right? I even, I, I just shared, you know, the 704 shop example of my, my shirt didn't fit right and they made it right. And I was, I was 100% on board with them ever since, right? So our question then is, okay, well, if, if customer service is kind of somewhere in the middle in this country, which I've, I've taught this class a lot, and it always seems to be somewhere right there between a three and a six, right? Right there in the middle is where we put it. And what I tell people is that means we got a lot of people that are unhappy with service, <laughs> right? We got a whole lot of people in this country that poor customer service is just kind of the norm, right? It's something we all, we all just kind of handle on a regular basis. But the thing is, we don't always know about it, right? Out of 25 dissatisfied customers, how many will you hear from? What do you guys think? So out of 25 dissatisfied customers, how many do you think actually will complain directly to the company? Like go back to the company and say something. All right, seeing some people say, say a couple things. Let's say five, five, one, one to two. Here's, here's the crazy, it's one, one. One out of 25 dissatisfied customers will complain about their experience to you, the company. Now that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean they don't share their dissatisfaction, right? This is just, this is just saying something directly to the company, right? And I think this is important, right? Because companies lose a ton of money due to customer churn. Chris mentioned it, right? $1.6 trillion a year is how much money companies lose, right? When it comes to this customer churn and customers leaving and trying to win new customers, right? That's, that's a huge amount of money. So we, we need to be thinking, well, what can we do to, to retain some of these customers? So we're not having to fight just to maintain, you know, an even even level, right? We should be fighting for new customers and keeping the ones that we have, not losing the ones we have and just backfilling them, right? So um, I've got some uh, some fascinating facts here. I want to hear from you guys, see what you guys think about uh, each one of these. So the first one, it costs an average of three times as much to attract a new customer as to keep an existing one. So Chris already pointed us in this, this direction, right? He said it's expensive to find new customers, right? So what do you guys think? Is this figure too high or too low? And what is the correct amount? What do you guys think? Too high or too low? And what is the correct amount? What do y'all think? Three times. Is that too high or too low? And what is the correct? All right. So Terry says four times uh, the amount. Michael says too low five times. Tiffany says five times. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in on this one? No, Monica just says it's higher than that. <laughs> All right. Here's, here it is, right? It's too low and it is five times, five times the amount uh, to attract a new customer as to keep the existing one. And if you think, especially cell phone companies, think about all the deals cell phone companies offer to try to get new customers in, right? That costs a lot of money. Uh, all right, how about this one? On average, dissatisfied customers tell five people in person about their negative experiences. On average, dissatisfied customers tell five people in person about their negative experiences. Is that too high or too low? And social networking and social media does not count here, right? So this is in person. See, too low, too low. <laughs> China says way too low, too low. It's 10 and above, says Renee. Yeah. All right. So here it is. It is too low and it's 10 to 16 times, 10 to 16 times, right? That's massive, right? That's how many people you tell in person. Now, here's the thing. In the last, what, 15 years, you know, it's, it's, it's blown up more than that because we all have these things right here. We all have phones, right? So literally, while I'm getting the bad customer service, like I'm putting that on Twitter, right? Like I'm, I'm actually doing something. Yeah, Michael, yeah. I mean, it's in the thousands if we bring in social media, right? Because just like that, you know, I can put something out and, and sometimes I can tag the company directly. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I don't, I just complain about it. And that's, and that's really important for us to remember. Cause remember the, the stat we saw one in 25 complains directly to the company. But what this says is dissatisfied customers. They don't keep their mouth shut just because they're not complaining to you at the organization doesn't mean they're not still making their voice heard. 
right? Um, and that can be dangerous because if they're not coming to you, then you know it's it's going to be more difficult for you to to have a service recovery and make things make things better, right? How about this one? It takes ten good customer service experiences to overcome a single bad one. What do you guys think? How many good customer service experiences does it take to overcome a bad one? Ten is ten too low, too high, and what do you guys think is the right number? All right, Chris says too high. Ashley says too high. Uh, Shonda says double that, so 20. It would take 20, all right? Here we go, correct answer. That's too low and it's 12, 12 times. So think how many times would you have to go back somewhere to, to, to actually overcome that really bad experience? Now, let's be honest, there's some bad experiences. You just don't, you just don't, you don't ever go back, right? My wife got food poisoning once at a restaurant in Gastonia. And every time I mentioned going back there, she's like, nope. Like she won't even give it, a, she won't even give them a second round, right? But for those of us who do, right? When we, when we kind of just have a, a, a bad experience, it's not terrible, it's just bad. It takes 12 times for us going back there to get that taste out of our mouth, right? So that's pretty big. How about this one? About 60% of unhappy customers won't buy from a company that upset them. What do you guys think? Is that too low or too high? 60% of unhappy customers won't buy again from a company that upset them. What do y'all think? Too high or too low? All right, too low, too low, too low, 70. Okay, Michael says 75. Willie just says it's too low. All right, let's take a look here. You're right, it is too low. It's 91% right? 91%. Now, this is upset, right? This isn't just kind of like oh, a little dissatisfied or it's not exactly what I wanted, but it's okay. This is like, I'm upset. Like you, you wasted my money, right? 91% of those folks will say, I'm, I'm, that's it. I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going back. I'm not buying anything. I don't care what kind of sale you put on. I don't care what kind of deal you offer me. I'm not doing this, right? Um, okay. Last one. Last one of our fascinating facts of so customers who switch to a competitor up to 70% say they were satisfied before making the switch. What do you guys think? Of customers that switched to a competitor, 70% say they were satisfied before making the switch. Is that too high or too low? Too high or too low? Think about this. They were, they were, uh, they were satisfied before making a switch. Too high. Right, Michael says too high. Any other thoughts on this last one? Really, the thing to think here is, is who's switching companies? Do you have to be unsatisfied to switch companies? Or is being satisfied, does that still make you switch, right? Here's the thing, it's too low. It's 80%. 80% of people said they were satisfied with a company before they switched to a, com a competitor. And that seems high until you start thinking, well, you know, a lot of people price shop, right? It's just by the month, by the numbers, right? So if the service you're providing me is just okay, like I'm satisfied. I'm not super satisfied. I don't love you, um, but I don't hate you either. If I get another, if I get another deal, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go somewhere else, right? So our, our thing is we should be, we should be able to find a way to, to make customers, even our difficult ones. And we want to build those in to making them the most loyal customers in the world so that that doesn't happen, right? So just being satisfied is not good enough. You want people that, that just absolutely love your brand, that don't wanna do anything but, but support you. I love what Jeff says here, right? Satisfaction does not equal loyalty. That's a, that's a great way of putting this, right? Loyalty means being more than satisfied, right? It means that I trust this company. I trust everything they say about it. I, and, and I love them. And that when I have a service bump with them, I don't even think about going somewhere else, right? I'm not going to leave just for a cheaper product. I'm not going to leave even if something goes wrong over here because I love these guys so much, right? I went to Chick-fil-A once and they got my order wrong and I love them so much that when I went in to get the order corrected, I apologized to them. They're the ones that got the order wrong. And I said, I am so sorry to have to make you guys redo this order, but, but I got the wrong thing, right? And I felt bad for having to bring it up to them, right? So that's, that's what loyalty looks like, right? So what does exceptional customer, uh, customer service look like to you guys? What do you guys think? I'd love, love to hear a couple of people put this in the chat box. What does exceptional customer service look like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? All right, let's see. Terry says, follow through. Love that one. 
honestly, in my time in customer service, most of my really irate customers came from us not following through, right? It was somebody said, I'll call you back or I'll do this. And then they actually didn't do it. And that's what created the, the service breakdown. What else does exceptional customer service look like or feel like? What do you guys think? Follow through, what else? Mm, it's more than a sell. Know more about me or my family. Like they just take time to get to know you, right? I love that one. Ashley says being heard. I love that. Um, exceeding your expectations, even if you have high expectations and still exceeding them, right? Um, yeah, Monica listening and addressing concerns. Uh, feel like care and effort were applied. Yeah, so, so they, they <laughs> it's this, just care, right? Just care about somebody. It's amazing how far that goes. Um, responsiveness, yes, Joyce. Yeah, <clears throat> you guys nailed it, right? Um, when we think about customer service, it's all of those things. Here's my actual definition, though. Uh, exceptional customer service is when you go above and beyond what a customer or client expects. Uh, you take that extra step to make them feel like you understand what they're going through, um, you understand what their needs, and you want this to be the best experience that they've had, right? That they that they rave about this. They go somewhere else and they tell their friends, their family, they're on social media saying, you guys aren't going to believe this. This is, you know, this is fantastic. You know, these guys are great. You need to check them out, right? That's what we're driving towards, right? Um, let's see, uh, Nick Crew says, uh, meeting and exceeding customer needs and anticipating needs questions they didn't even know they had. I love that one too, right? And that takes some courage from a service provider to like bring up an issue before that issue is even started, right? Because they know if I say this, I'm opening up a can of worms, but by doing this, I'm actually, I'm actually gonna save this customer hassle down the road. And that takes courage to do that, right? Um, all right, so this is what customers desire. This is what we know customers want. They want friendliness. They want a smile, right? They want, they want a nice tone. They want somebody who feels like, you know, I, you know, I'm happy to help you, right? They want somebody that, 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 sh that shows a little bit of empathy with, with what they're going through, with what's going on with them. They want fairness. They want to be deep. They want to be treated fairly, regardless of um, their socioeconomic status, regardless of their gender, regardless of anything else. They want to be treated fairly and respectfully, right? They want participation, <clears throat> right? They want help in trying to get things get get things fixed right they want alternatives it's not just you know black or white it's not this or this it's hey let's let's brainstorm some solutions let's find alternatives on how we can get certain things done and they want information right they want uh they want their service providers to be informative with them and saying hey these are your choices this is what we can do um this is what works this is what doesn't work all of those different things right <clears throat> so we know that this is what we're driving towards we're driving towards delivering all of this to our customers. But we do have to stop and think for a second, where do we deliver customer service, right? So let me ask you guys that question. Where, where is customer service delivered? What are our different kind of mediums or places that we deliver customer service or we experience it, right? Does it all have to be face-to-face? Huh. Ashley, Ashley went with like the, the, uh, the price is right answer everywhere. It's just everywhere. <laughs> um, Joyce, uh, yeah. Email phone calls, <clears throat> zoom. I mean, this is, this is weird. Five years ago, you know, people probably would not have said zoom in and, and, and video conferencing as an, as a Avenue of customer service, but it is right. It's certainly more, more one now than ever. Um, you're right. Email phone calls, even self-service, right? Just being able to do things on your own and go through the grocery store and check out your own groceries. That's actually customer service. Even though there's not somebody there, how the computer's set up, how easy is it to use? How easy is it to navigate? All of those things matter, right? Um, you've got live chat. We've got mobile messaging. We got social media. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways we can do it. Now, if you're on a website and you're trying to buy something, you get the little pop-up window. Hey, is there anything I can help you with? Sometimes that's a real person. Sometimes it's just a, a, a service bot, but it's still customer service, right? It's still somebody or the organization trying to help you out, right? So it's important for us to remember that we've got all these different options when it comes to, to how we provide service, right? And in the eyes of the customer, they, they're all kind of the same, right? Yeah, this was face-to-face, -face, this was email, you know, this was on the website, 
but it's all still important because it's all still service, right? And to neglect one of those, to mess up and not do what we're supposed to in one of those avenues or one of those places, it's going to impact us everywhere else, right? Um, and those things matter. I do want to take a second, though, and, and mention kind of, you know, how we can see how we're doing with customers, right? Um, now, of course, you know, some companies have the, the surveys that they send out. How's this going? How's this doing? Customers respond to that. You know, you go to Taco Bell and they hand you the receipt and say, call this number and tell us how we did. So we got those things. But of course, we all have the access to the Internet, right? And we can go in and we can leave reviews for companies um, pretty easily now, right? Way easier than it used to be because you just take your phone and type it in. So we see an example here, right? Right. Of somebody that's complaining. This is actually a trucking company. Um, and they're complaining about how they're, what kind of service they, they experienced, right? They got one star, one star out of five. And, you know, just like that, it's out there and all the potential customers can see that there was this, this complaint, right? We also have these, right? You know, here's two five-star reviews that are out here, right? Now, if we think about it, these are pretty important, right? Because whether we see the negative review or we see the positive review, this gives us an opportunity to maybe do something about it, right? So we see the negative review and we say, hey, let's contact that customer. Let's see if we can make things right. We see this, we might call that customer and say, hey, thanks for the feedback, right? Tell us a little bit more about what we're doing, right? These are important factors in customers deciding whether or not they wanna to continue to work with the organization. If, they, if they're trying to decide where do I take my business, right? We look at these things. I don't know about y'all, but when I go buy something on Amazon that I'm not so sure about, I go look at those Amazon reviews, right? I go look and see what other people have said about this organization or this product before I decide to, to give them my business, right? So it's really important that we start addressing some of those issues that pop up so that we can see more reviews like this one right here, right? So I've got a poll for you guys. I've got a poll for you. So Michael, let's go ahead and get that poll queued up here. How do you think people typically react to customers who are being difficult? So I want you guys to think, how do you think service providers or people typically react to customers who they perceive as being difficult, okay? So I want you guys to go ahead and, and, and vote there. How do you think uh, people typically react to customers who are being difficult? And then I've got some, some average numbers that we're gonna take a look at. We'll see if our group here today uh, is reflected kind of in, in where, uh, where everybody else is. All right, let's see. All right, the numbers are coming in here. We got 34 people. Got 34 people in the room. So let's uh let's uh let's get those last votes in here. Come on, folks. We're at 18, 19. All right. So it looks like we're we're kind of uh, we're kind of teetering back and forth, avoiding being the number one uh, reason you guys are coming up with, uh, compromising, uh, and accommodating, kind of neck and neck there for second. Competing is at the at the very end there, and I do think you know sometimes that does happen, right? With with service providers, we feel like we're going to win this, right? I'm going to beat this customer into submission. It's really not the best business practice, but sometimes I've seen that happen, right? Uh, then we've got compromising and accommodating. Yet sometimes those those do those do play into things, right? Uh, and then avoiding, where I just don't I just don't want to deal with this. Uh, and I've seen that happen plenty of times, where where they're just avoiding the issue, right? Um, and it's kind of sad that the 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 most constructive one is actually collaborating, and nobody voted for that one, right? And so that I think is something for us to look at, right? If we look at a, a questionnaire that was sent out. Um, through Thomas Kilman, this is actually the results here. Uh, so this is, you, you guys, I, I don't think are too far, too far off of what we're seeing here. Um, but we've got compromising and avoiding as the, as, the top, as the top two. So you guys are kind of along those lines there. Collaborating does have some representation here. It doesn't in our little local one. Um, but if we look at this number here, we've got almost a third uh, of the time, we basically just avoid conflict. Our service providers, are avoiding conflict. They're trying to avoid it. Uh, and typically when we avoid conflict, all we do is just kick that conflict down, right? Um, you know, we're going to have issues with this customer later. We're just not facing it head on like we need to. 
Um, so that's so that's not good. Compromising is okay, right? It's finding a solution that's working for the customer. So about a third of the time we're compromising, that's fine. And then the other third of the time, it's one of these other ones, right? But we really need to be looking for those opportunities to, to compromise, maybe uh, to collaborate and, and find solutions with our with our customers. Accommodating is sometimes the right move. Like if the company did something wrong, like if I if 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 we just flat out did something wrong, then we should accommodate the customer, right? We should accommodate them and do whatever we need to to, to make things right. And competing isn't necessarily wrong. There are times where maybe a company does need to compete and just say, you know what, this is the way it works, right? We can't do things anything, we can't operate a different way. Um, I know they're not a private organization, but it's still customer service. I got my passport renewed a couple of weeks ago and you know, I, I needed it done really fast. And they basically were like, this is how it's going to work, right? Uh, and there was no amount of me complaining that was going to change that process, right? That was, a, that was a competing point of view from the passport agency, but that's the way it works, right? So, you know, that's not even necessarily a wrong one, but I think it's, it's interesting for us to look at these different solutions for us and, and remind ourselves as service providers, we need to be looking for those compromising and those accommodating places, right? All right, um, <laughs> Chris, I will tell you how long it took. I've, I've got a secret. I'll, I'll let you in on my secret uh, later. <laughs> All right, so let's keep on rolling. Um, there's a couple different things that we can do to, uh, to, to make things work better for us, right? The first one here, this one's amazing. Um, and it sounds really, really simple, um, but it has power. And that is introduce yourself. It is amazing to me that when somebody knows your name, you're not just, you're not just some generic person, but this is my name. They, they're nicer to you, right? So as a, as a service provider, say, hey, my name is Rob and I'm here to help you. And you, know, and you can ask the customer, I'm, I'm, you know, you know, what's your name? Or you know, what, what, what can I call you? Something along those lines so that you can start establishing a personal relationship with this person, right? Telling the customer your name and learning theirs is this natural place for a, for a, for a better interaction between us, right? It actually helps us connect on kind of a human level and a friendship level and allows us to build a relationship rather than just kind of saying, yes, Mr. Customer, or yes, sir, or, yes, ma'am. Although those are respectful and they're fine, but if we can use names, there's power in a name, right? So let's, let's think about that. Let's remember that that is an option for us, right? Um, nothing's more infuriating for a customer, you know, if you think about it, um, when they're already upset uh, and they're already angry about something, you know, and then they're just not treated with respect. They're just not treated with, uh, with care or like you care about them, right? When, when I asked you guys about difficult customers, one of the things you guys said was care, right? And the, there, there was a lack of care. So anytime we can use their name, there is care there, right? It's, it says, I care about you as a person. And if something happens and we, we get disconnected or, or we get, you know, we get separated, now you know my name and you can say, you know what, Jeff, I was just talking to Rob. Can you put, can you put Rob back on? Absolutely. And then Jeff can, can bring them back over to me and we can keep having the conversation in case we had some technical issues or something like that. And not to mention giving you my name says, I'm going to own this problem. I'm going to own it. You know my name now. So if things go wrong, you can call me back. And, uh, and so I want to make sure that I get things done. Right. Number two here, uh, assume that the customer has the right to be angry. Right. So maybe they're being a little unreasonable. It happens. Right. But the reality is, if their perception is something that made them angry, then it made them angry. Right. That's 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 the way it is. And emotions are emotions, regardless of what created the emotion. That is their emotion. Their emotion is I'm not happy right now. So we're going to approach that and say, OK, well, you know, what can I do to help this? Right. How can I improve this? Right. Um, we're not going to just kind of go, well, they're stupid for being angry about this, or this is ridiculous for them to be so angry about this. We don't know what, what they're going through, right? We don't know what the challenges are that they're experiencing on their side, right? So we just, we're just going to say, hey, you know what? They have the right to be angry, and I'm going to take it seriously. I'm going to show some empathy to this person, right? Um, they could be angry for a whole host of reasons, right? It could be they just had a bad day. It could be their, uh, their dog got hit by a car this morning. Who knows what's creating the issue for them? But we're going to do our best to try to uh, to try to you know work with them and make things better, uh, regardless, right? Um, so if they're irate, I'm just going to listen. I'm just going to sit there and listen. I'm going to listen really carefully. 
I'm going to listen to some important words. I'm going to listen to what they're telling me. And uh, it's amazing. A lot of times, if you just let them vent, then you can say, okay, I understand you're upset. Let's talk about ways we can fix this, right? Um, and let them get that emotion out. Don't, don't belittle their emotion. Don't act like it's not there. Acknowledge it and then move on to the business, right? Number three here, listen to emotion without emotion. So we're already going down this path, right? So I'm going to listen to all of this. I'm going to listen to you say things, right? When I was at the bank, man, I heard all kinds of things. But the reality is it's just emotion for them. I'm, a, I'm, I'm in a professional setting. I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to let it just roll right off. Yeah, I'm not going to take it personally. I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to take it uh, as a as a shot at me. I'm just going to sit there and listen. Uh, and once they're done with it, then I can acknowledge their emotion, right? So I'm going to acknowledge their emotion. I'm going to acknowledge that they're upset about it, but then I'm going to focus on solving the problem, right? Um, and that's one of my big things: is know your anchor. So know why we're here talking, um, and let's bring it back to that, right? So here's your emotion. I recognize your emotion. This is your problem. Let's solve your problem. And when they start going back down an emotional path, just say, I understand you're upset, but let's talk about this so we can get this fixed, right? And keep coming back to those things. Number four here is be patient, right? Customer conversations and, and anger, it comes in waves, man. It's not like it's just one and then it's over, right? It's like, boom, boom, boom. And we just have to be patient and kind of ride through the storm, right? Um, it's not effective to, to stop a customer, even though sometimes we're, we're tempted to, right? Sometimes we're like, I've heard this, right? I've heard this complaint five times and you want to stop the customer from, from talking and just fix the problem, but that's not effective, right? We want to, we want to actually just sit there and let them talk. And then once they're done, then we can chime in, right? We have to be patient with them, be patient with their, with their anger, be patient with maybe their solutions and what they've tried to do, right? Just let them kind of go through those motions a little bit. Take some deep breaths on our side, wait patiently for our turn to speak, and we're going to be listening the entire time. We're not tuning them out. We're listening so that our response is proper and correct given the situation, right? All right, so be patient. That's what uh, number four. Number five, speak softly, right? Speaking calmly and softly with a nice steady tone can take a lot of emotions and stress out of a conversation, right? Somebody's sitting there yelling at you. And of course your natural response is I'm going to up my volume and I'm going to meet you where you are. But if I start yelling and then Jeff's yelling at me and now I'm yelling at Jeff and we're going back and forth, next thing you know, we're yelling at each other. And guess what? We're probably not yelling at whatever the issue is, right? We're actually just, we're just yelling, right? We're not actually making things better, right? So we're not going to try to shout over a customer or interrupt them or anything like that, right? If we really want our, our, our side to be heard, if we want the customer to hear what we're saying, we need to wait. We need to let them get their tirade out, get the, all their emotion out, and then we're going to wait for that time to speak. We can let some silence lay in there. It's amazing to me sometimes when somebody, when I've had a customer who's really angry, I would just be quiet. And then sooner or later, they go, hello, hello, are you still there? Yes, sir, I'm still here. I understand you're upset. Let's, let's talk about this that you're upset about, right? So let that silence hang in there for a little bit if you need to. Let them deflate a little bit and recognize their emotion and then we'll respond properly, right? We're gonna keep our tone the, the where, it, where it needs to be. We're not be call, going, going to be confrontational with our tone. We're not gonna be confrontational with our, with our volume. We're just gonna be nice and calm. We're gonna be the steady ship in the storm, right? All right, so that's number five. Number six, reiterate. So I love this one. As I mentioned, you know, I'm big on knowing your anchor, right? So let's listen to them. Let's see what's going on with them. We can recognize some of the emotions uh, that are going on. Um, I'm going to reiterate what I've heard from them, right? So I'm going to be listening. I'm going to be paraphrasing back to them. I'm going to make sure I'm inquisitive. I'm asking questions about things. I'm going to ask those probing questions. Tell me more about this. Tell me more about that. I'm going to restate facts. I'm going to restate their priorities. I'm going to restate my place. And like I said, know your anchor. So no, this is why we're talking. We're talking because of this right here. And customers will try to go down this path and go down this path. We're just going to keep coming things back to the anchor, right? So you get too emotional. Okay, I know my anchor. I'm going to come back to this. This is why we're talking and this is what we want to fix, right? So know your anchor, right? Number seven, this one's really big. I already kind of mentioned this one a little bit, but is own the problem. So if I'm if I give you my name, if I say my name's Rob Dibble, I'm going to fix this for you. That's owning the problem, right? That's saying I'm going to take care of it. Now the reality is, 
especially if you work in a large organization, you might not be able to fix everything yourself, right? You're going to have to go to another department. You, the customer might actually have to go to another department to get something taken care of, but I'm going to own this experience for you, right? I'm going to listen to what it is that you're saying. I'm going to say, okay, if I can't help you, I'm going to take you to the, I'm, you're only going to be transferred one time. I'm only going to take you to, to one other department and they're going to be the ones that help you. If I can't do it, I'm going to hold your hand and make sure that you get to somewhere that can, right? Anytime I can, I want to do everything myself so that your experience is as seamless as possible. If I have to call seven of the other departments to get this resolved for you, then I will. But you don't have to do that, right? I'm not going to make you talk to anybody else unless I absolutely have to. So own the problem, own the experience, right? Make sure you you express that to them too, right? And, and tell them, hey, I'm your guy. I'm your person. If you have any problems with this, call me. Here's my extension. Here's my email, right? Make that personal connection. Develop that relationship. And as soon as that's developed, the, the, the civility that goes back and forth will go up tenfold, right? Because they're going to feel like, okay, I've got somebody I can trust and they're looking out for me, right? So own the problem. Number eight, place the customer first and the problem second. So yeah, of course the problem is important, right? That's, that's why we're here. But we got to keep in mind this customer relationship, right? The emotions that they have, um, the, the, the conflict that they have, right? There's all this stuff going on, right? And remember that the customer is the most important thing in, in all these cases, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a problem that we are going to have to deal with and we're going to fix. But I'm really focused on this customer relationship, right? And saying, hey, how is this working, right? What can I do to improve this customer relationship? But beyond just fixing the problem, right? Because the reality is, you know, they call up and they're upset. I might be able to click one button and fix the problem. Boom, your problem is done. All right, bye. Right? Or do we say, okay, Mr. Customer, I understand. I understand it's, you know, that you're frustrated and blah, 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 blah. And I'm using my tone of voice and I'm using my listening skills and I'm being empathic with them. Right. And then I'm fixing the problem, but I'm recognizing this customer relationship that we have. Right. That's number eight. Number nine is triage. Right. Uh, so what we mean by this is once you have an opportunity to focus on the technical and the administrative issues, triage the root cause of this. So let's figure out why did this happen in the first place, right? Now, obviously, we want to take care of the customer right then and there. So whatever we have to do to fix the issue for the customer, let's do that. Um, but then the next part is let's do a root cause analysis. Let's find out why this happened. Um, maybe we can be proactive and make sure that this thing doesn't happen uh, in the future, right? We can provide some corrective measures. We have some information, right? We might be able to, to fix problems for other customers, right? So that we don't have to deal with this again and our coworkers don't have to deal with this again. And more importantly, it doesn't become a brand for our organization. The worst thing in the world is when an organization gets saddled with, oh, don't go to this company because they do X, right? So we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we triage it, the root cause analysis, we try to figure out what's going on. And that takes us to number 10, which is correct the issue. So offer a solution, right? If we've triaged the things, we've got a root cause analysis, let's try to correct that issue with our customer. If it's an individual issue, we wanna fix that, right? Offer, offer this solution. Um, let's try to make it uh, as long-term impactful as possible, right? I don't wanna band-aid on this. I wanna make it fixed. so We don't have to address this again, right? Now, I do think it's important, um, you know, when we talk about offering the solution, notice I didn't say do the solution to so offer the solution, right? So if we have three or four different ways to go, let's make sure we provide those options to the customer. We can do this, this, or this. Which one would be a better suit, uh, better suited for you, right? Sometimes we jump to the conclusion and assume that we know what the customer wants. We might not, right? We want to offer that solution and let them uh, let them kind of pick which one works best for them, right? Or we can demonstrate our confidence and our knowledge, and we can recommend things and say, well, we probably should do this, or if we do this, here's some things that might occur, right? But we're going to demonstrate that we care about them uh, and that we care about this specific situation and that they're getting resolved, uh, getting things resolved in a way that they need, right? Not necessarily the way that we need, right? Either way, we're correcting the issue. We're getting things taken care of. And then the last one there is follow up, right? So we're going to close the loop on this. Um, we're going to verify that the customer feels like their situation was, was addressed, that they got what they needed, right? When possible, we're going to follow up the customer um, at, at a later time, right? Call them up a week later, a month later and say, hey, we did this. Is that still working for you? Is there anything else we can do? 
um, you know, if there's, you know, if there, if it's not working, please tell me now, here's my name, here's my number, call me if anything goes wrong, right? Build this relationship. You know, um, I look at, I just look at my life, uh, whether it's an HVAC company or a, or a mechanic or, you know, all kinds of different places. I've got those, those people, right? And you guys are probably similar to this. These people that we trust and we go to, and it's because they follow up with us, right? They close the loop every time. I, I had my HVAC service uh, a week ago and I got a little note in my mailbox yesterday that said, hey, you know, we topped up your, your HVAC with, with Freon last week, just checking to make sure that, that it's, all, it's all working okay. Here's our phone number. If it's not, we'll be happy to come back out. Something as simple as that, you know, I took that um, and I put that on my on my refrigerator and I was like, there, all right, I've, there, there's my guy. If something happens this summer, I know who I'm going to call, right? And it was because they, they reached out after the fact to make sure that we were happy, right? Uh, so what seems uh, to us as bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. So I think we can, we can flip the script a little bit on this and we can say, you know what? Upset customers, um, difficult customers, yeah, they're upset. Yeah, they're difficult and they, they might make our life difficult, but the reality is one, they're the reason why we have jobs oftentimes. And two, that an upset customer or a difficult customer, um, a service breakdown provides us an opportunity to deepen a customer relationship and for them to look at us as, as more than just this company, but they start looking at us as a trusted service provider, somebody that I want repeat business, someone I want to go to. And then past that, somebody that I tell my friends about, right? And I say, hey, if you've got this problem, you need to go talk to these people, right? Um, and and when, you're proud of, when you're proud of a relationship you have with an organization, you do those things, right? And I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk 704 shop for one last second, and then I'm going to ask questions, right? So I was wearing a 704 shop uh, shirt to the Charlotte FC match a couple of weeks ago, and it's the one that has uh, the queen, like Queen Charlotte on the back. And I had all these Charlotte FC people going, where did you get that shirt? That shirt is so awesome. I want a, I want that shirt. And, and I love Chris and I love 704 shop folks. And I was like, here, like they're, they're right down the street at Camden, go down there. Their shirts are great. They're great people. They're UNC Charlotte alums, uh, go support a local organization, a local company. It, it makes me feel good. And I know that makes Chris feel good, but that's what happens when you have, when you have customers that believe in your organization, they tell other people. And that is, that is advertising and marketing that you, that you don't have to pay for. And it's actually more powerful than the marketing and advertising that you do pay for, right? So um, what questions do you guys have for me around uh, building, uh, building your, your, your customer base and, and building those customer relationships and taking difficult customers and making them your loyal ones? Any thoughts? All right. Can we get these slides? Jeff, I'm, I'm going to let Jeff answer that question. Absolutely. We can get, we'll, I'll include that in the uh, follow-up email. I'll, as an, in addition to the recording, we'll put a copy of these slides in there. Awesome. Any other questions for me? All right. Well, Jeff, I will I'll flip things over to you. Sounds good. So as I mentioned in the beginning, um, and let me just first say, Rob, awesome job. Thank you for taking us through this content today. Yeah, absolutely. This is something that a lot of this stuff might seem obvious, I'll say, that you're like, well, of course you want to treat your customers, but how you go about it is is what separates you from the from the competition. And that's it's easier said than done. As I mentioned at the very beginning of this, it's some of these things might seem intuitive, but you know, it's, I'll say one thing we didn't really get go into in this. And I, I did see a few people, people comment on this is it's not just, I mean, any one of us can watch this and start applying these. One of the challenges with really making customers advocates is, ma is making this intentional and consistent. And those are, that's really where the rubber meets the road with this work. It's any one of us individually could be excellent. We could apply all these techniques and, you know, blow it out of the water every time we talk to a customer, but if it's not done intentionally and consistently across the organization at all those different touch points that Rob mentioned, um, it's, it's, it can all crumble and fall yeah, apart. Well, and, and Jeff, to your point, that's one of the things that people talk about Chick-fil-A, right? And, mm -hmm. and that it doesn't matter which Chick-fil-A you go to, the service is almost, almost always identical, right? It, it's always my pleasure. It's always a happy tone. It's, it's, 
it's part of their culture versus like I mentioned, you go to a McDonald's or you go to a Burger King and it's hit or miss. You, it might be great. It might be terrible. But as an organization, Chick-fil-A blows, blows them out of the water, right? And it's because they prioritize it. They say this is something that's important to us. They hire for that, right? They look for people that can deliver that type of service experience for their customers. And, uh, you know, you know, there's, a, there's organizations in the world that look at Chick-fil-A and go, yo, I wish we could do that. And they could, they just don't, right? Yeah, yeah. And we tried to pick things today to talk about in, in this session that are going to be, I guess you could say, very much, I, I would put these into the universal truths category as far as these are things that could always be applied, regardless of your industry or your sector that you're in or the type of, type of audience you're trying to serve. But depending on what organization and audience you're trying to serve and whatever, you know, different, as, as Rob mentioned, a huge organization is going to have different challenges than a smaller shop. And so that's where that's where I get into this to say this is really just the tip of the iceberg of what you know we could develop. We can go into more detail and more content like this. We have courses that can help with this. Everything from employee engagement to building a culture, all these kinds of things that can really take this to the next level beyond just you as individuals. All that being said, please share this with people in your organization. Share this. This is free. This is share this with the others in your org. I encourage you to get the word out. You know, and that's a good first step. But it's this is a this is a um, in some organizations, this might take a lot more time and effort and intentionality to say, okay, what's going to work best for us? In addition to the things we talked about today, there's more we can do. And that's where we get into some of the things we talked about today. You know, talk to us if you need help with any of this stuff, figuring it out what's best for our organization. How do we go further with this? How do we implement it in my organization? You know, that kind of thing. You know, Rob can help us. There's, 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 a, lot of, there's a lot we can do to help you and your organization. So that's why we've got some of these links up here. And then Rob, you know, on the next page, you'll see there's some ways we can stay connected to us. Um, and I was going to say, I mean, coaching, coaching is a huge part of this, right? So if your organization says, this is what, this is what we want to do. Um, then if you don't coach against it, it's not going to happen. Right. So, yeah. so first of all, it's knowing it, implementing it and then coaching against it. Right. And that's a perfect tee up to the next slide, because this is a series, as I mentioned. So the next conversation that we're going to have in June, better coaching conversations, building winning cultures. This is, you know, employee engagement. These are all things that I, as we talk about this, we built this in a series to kind of build off each other. So please, if you know, this is something or, you know, some of these other topics interest you, come back because we keep trying to evolve, move the conversation forward, try to build on what we're talking about because they all, this is a cumulative approach. None of these things are, you know, um, things in, in and to themselves usually this, as part of a bigger issue and bigger effort in your organizations and your teams and your groups. So I encourage you to come back to one of these future webinars um, they're all free. This is a free development service that the university is offering to the community. So take advantage of it because um, we really have great speakers like Rob leading us through this content. And we've got, uh, this is once again, tip of the iceberg as far as what this content can really do for your organization. So that being said, I'll let you guys, uh, well, actually last one last slide is that if there's any questions, um, any last questions for Rob? Um, other than that, we'll let you guys go. We got a few minutes before two. So we got you out in under an hour. Awesome. Hey, Chris, I'll send you a message. <laughs> we'll see y'all later. Thank y'all. Right, thank you. Have all. a great day. Bye-bye.